right now. A maze of walls and tunnels leading to a trash filled community underground. What a local police department found moments away. But first, a big jump tonight in confirmed COVID-19 cases here in Bear County. More than 100 cases added to our count. There are now 1,477. That jump attributed to widespread testing at the Bear County Jail. Tonight, the death toll remains at 48. 746 people still fighting the virus tonight. 683 have recovered. 60 people are in the hospital. Speaking during today's daily briefing, San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg mentioned 50 Texas National Guard teams are being trained here to help with COVID-19 response across the state. Those teams will be completely trained by tomorrow, and already six teams will be deployed here in San Antonio. We have one team that is going to be conducting a, um, a mobile site for testing at the Frank Garrett Center. Another one of those Texas National Guard teams will help out with testing at the Bear County Jail, where, as we said, the number of cases continues to rise. As of tonight, at least 157 inmates have tested positive. Stephen Cavazos joins us live from the jail with details on the confirmed cases. Stephen. Well, AC today, Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf talked about the testing that's happening here at the Bear County Jail. He said of the number of positive cases that we're seeing, many aren't showing any symptoms at all. Now, of the 157 confirmed cases, 122 are inmates that are still here at the jail. Now, some have been hospitalized, and we do know at least 10 have recovered. You can't hold a prisoner just because he's because he may have um, have COVID. He has a right to get out just as anybody else does when his time is up. So it would have to be a shelter in place issue uh, that you would try to do with him once he does get out. Now, of those testing, those that are testing positive, that is, are being separated from other inmates at the jail. Judge Wolf says that while the jail is currently testing 150 inmates and guards a day, that number is expected to rise. That additional help could be coming from the Texas National Guard teams that the governor has deployed. Some of those teams have been trained to help out with testing in congregated areas like the jail. Now, it's unclear how many deputies have tested positive for COVID-19, but city and county leaders say that as testing uh, capacity increases, that is, the number of tests the number of positive cases will also increase. Reporting live outside the Bear County Jail, Stephen Cavazos, KSAT 12 News. Steve Isis. Thank you, Stephen. Emergency use now approved for a drug to treat patients with COVID-19. This week, we showed you how UT Health became part of an international effort to learn more about remdesivir. Early results showed the recovery rate was 31% shorter than using a placebo. The mortality rate also fell. A researcher who oversaw the clinical trial by UT Health San Antonio and University Hospital says it's not a cure, but it is a breakthrough. UT Health says, quote, with FDA emergency authorization, all hospitalized COVID-19 patients meeting criteria for use can receive remdesivir, which is now the standard of care, end quote. It is day one of the reopenings amid this pandemic. Retail stores, restaurant, dining rooms, movie theaters and malls allowed to reopen in Texas as long as they keep up with social distancing measures and only allow 25 percent of their occupancy inside. Ingram Park Mall's doors open again. About 20 percent of the stores inside are welcoming customers in a limited capacity. More stores in the mall expected to open over the next few days. But as the city mentioned today, flea markets are not included in this round of reopenings. The short answer is anything that doesn't fall squarely within the governor's orders um, does raise a question in terms of interpretation. And so with regard to your question about flea markets, we, we did get the question today about outdoor flea markets, and it's not clearly covered by the governor's order and as a result, not clearly governed by our local orders. The city says the health transition team also discourages outdoor gatherings until phase three of the city and county plan. So that is why places like Traders Village, a flea market, will not be opening this weekend. Traders Village planned to open this weekend, and while managers say they disagree with the decision, they will honor the city's wishes and remain closed. While the state has not cleared 
and allowed all businesses to reopen. Uvalde County officials say they're leaving it up to certain businesses to decide for themselves. The mayor and county judge there have said they're adding gyms and salons to the list of businesses that could reopen today. However, the state attorney general's office has said allowing such businesses to, to open goes against the governor's orders. A resource here at home will be opened up on Monday. Bibliotech, Bear County's all digital library, is hoping to provide Wi Fi to students who may be struggling to complete online classwork due to a lack of internet access. Tiffany Huertas has a look at all the changes Bibliotech has made to ensure the community and staff are safe when they return. When we had to close down, Knowing that people rely on our services, it was it was difficult for us to do that. Bear County's digital public library has been closed during the coronavirus pandemic. Since things have been closed down, um, people that are unable to access, you know, don't have Wi-Fi at home or don't have a computer at home. They've been really, really in a bad spot, particularly for those families who have been trying to educate their kids at home. But soon those families will have access again. Bibliotech is set to open on Monday and will operate at 25% capacity. The reason we made that decision to open is because we are in neighborhoods that do not have access to um, to the internet. Uh, the vast majority of people in those in the east side, west side, south side do not have that access. Bibliotech's director says people will be required to wear a mask. They will also have their temperature checked before entering. Laura Cole says they have been disinfecting the different locations in preparation of next week. Today and yesterday, we kind of did walkthroughs at each of our branches with the staff so that they could know what you know, how we're going to be able to do this safely for everyone. We'll have social distancing markers out, uh, traffic patterns marked out. Cole says the children's area and community rooms will be closed. Computer sessions will be limited to one hour sessions so that more people can use them. Our branches have always been located intentionally in challenged areas where people don't have the discretionary income necessarily to have uh, a broadband service they, uh, or, you know, or a device. Opening back up is important to us, um, even in a limited capacity. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. Let's take a look at the cases of COVID-19 in our surrounding counties. Not much has changed in the past couple of days. Hayes County still reporting 167 cases. Kendall County at 16. Comal County still reporting at 58 cases. Guadalupe County did report an increase in positive cases today. They are now at 85. Wilson County reporting 32. Atascosa County reporting 16. Trash, feces, shopping carts, and people living in the middle of that. The city of Hollywood Park is trying to figure out how to clean out an underground homeless city just uncovered this week. The half mile long drainage tunnel stretched into other jurisdictions, and the police chief says he's trying to coordinate the cleanup. The night team's Patty Santos shows us inside. The amount of materials and deco uh, decomposing food and feces and all that, it creates an environment and a smell like you've never seen or heard. Hollywood Park Police Chief Shad Pritchard tells us he's never seen conditions like this before. When you first walk into these tunnels, it just seems like it goes on forever. And then it just opens up into a room. And then more tunnels and more rooms, and it really is like a small little town down there. The police body camera shows us the hidden town full of furniture, food, feces, and people. It is, there's shopping carts, there's lawnmowers, there's trash, there's clothes, there's just about anything you can imagine that people throw away. Hey, y'all need to go. Pritchard and his officers walk in daily to clear people out. Every shift we're, we're just going through and unfortunately we have to walk through them. The homeless city uncovered this week when an officer saw someone crawl in. When he took a baseball bat and beat the guy. Police say they've been tracking an increase in crime around businesses along the highway between 1604 and Mecca Drive. The first entrance starts at San Pedro and Mecca and is hidden behind bushes. It crosses State Highway 281 and several shopping centers and it ends here about half a mile away. The problem says the chief is there's other smaller entrances. He estimates with all the tunnels included, it's about a three mile underground area and cleaning it up is proving to be as big of an endeavor as clearing people out. Here's the challenge. TxDOT says they own a portion of this cleanup effort. Uh, 
city of San Antonio has to step in and do their portion of the cleanup. And then somewhere in the middle is Hollywood Park. And we're not even sure who's going to fit the bill. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. The latest now out of North Korea, the state-run newspaper, they're releasing a series of photos they say are of Kim Jong-un at a ribbon cutting. Today it was reported he was at an opening ceremony for a fertilizer plant. It would be the first time in weeks. Speculation about his health swirled after he missed his late grandfather's birthday celebration last month. The date on a sign behind Kim in one of the photos does say May 1st, 2020. San Antonio is seeing a difference in car sales when compared to much of the nation. A closer look at what you can expect coming up. And a new study revealing how coronavirus may have spread through a restaurant in China. And plus, nearly a million dollars worth of cars stolen. Police now say kids were involved in these thefts. That story next on the night beat. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. Nearly 50 cars stolen from more than a dozen dealerships in North Carolina. Police say kids, some as young as nine years old, are accused in the case. The stolen cars were worth nearly a million dollars. All but six of the cars have been found. And now investigators are trying to figure out how all these kids got involved. Um, as a police officer and as a parent, it, it's scary. I mean, to think a nine-year-old um, is involved with a group of people that are doing some potentially dangerous crimes because, I mean, they're driving in a vehicle, not legal driving or not legal drivers of age and no experience. Police are working with parents to determine punishment. It was back in December when the first cases began popping up in China, reportedly from an animal market in Wuhan, China. Five months later, the virus spread around the world. Lockdowns were issued and now we're in the process of reopening. But tonight there is new information about how a virus may have spread in a restaurant in China. A new study says on January 23rd, the day Wuhan was locked down, a family traveled from there to a city near Hong Kong before eating at a restaurant. Less than two weeks later, nine other people got the virus, five who were not seated at their table. Some of the people who got sick were more than 15 feet away. Researchers believe the restaurant's poor ventilation system, along with overcrowding, may have helped transmit the virus. The CDC maintains the virus rarely travels more than six feet and is transmitted by droplets. And as Texas moves to try and reopen, Texas Senator John Cornyn not mincing words when asked about the U.S. relationship with China. I think there's going to be a, a day of reckoning and accountability and, and a lot of changes in terms of our reliance on China for our supply chain for critical equipment and, uh, and drugs. The White House says they are working on a U.S. response when it comes to China. Nadia Romero tracking that issue as well as the latest on a potential treatment and protests amid COVID-19. It's no secret that China mishandled this situation. The Trump administration is formulating a long-term plan to punish China on multiple fronts for the coronavirus pandemic. During her first briefing as White House press secretary, Kelly McEnany held back on diving into details. When it comes to retaliatory measures, um, I will not get ahead of the president on that. Now, with the promise of a possible treatment and the antiviral drug remdesivir. He uh, authorized uh, Gilead's application for emergency use authorization for the use of remdesivir in hospitalized patients. President Trump hosted remdesivir maker Gilead in the Oval Office Friday. We're humbled by this being an important first step for patients, for hospitalized patients. This as America remains divided over reopening. While more than 30 states now relaxing restrictions, Michigan's governor extended the state's emergency declaration to the end of May. <laughs> Protesters stormed the state's capital, some of them armed. Governor Whitmer saying she respects people's right to protest, but she says the latest demonstration is sending the wrong message. Swastikas and Confederate flags, nooses and automatic rifles do not represent who we are as Michiganders. In Texas, just one day after reporting a spike in deaths, people went out to restaurants and hit the beach. I'm Nadia Romero reporting. Let's take a live look outside downtown with live cam 76 degrees out there. I am looking for the weekend. I don't care what weather we have. It has been a week, so I'm just looking forward. To and it. judging by the flag, it looks like it's a little breezy out there. Yeah. yeah, and you know that breeze is coming in off the Gulf of Mexico and 
We all know what that means tomorrow. The humidity is back and it's going to be here to stay for several days. And I do think we'll see another little break in that humidity by the latter half of next week. But I got more information from NASA. You know, I love to show you the comparisons of the nitrogen dioxide pollution in the air uh, from before the shutdown to compared to during the shutdown. And you look on the left, this is for the southeastern United States, the Carolinas and Georgia. And this is the average for the time period of March 15th to April 15th from 2015 to 2019. Okay, that's the average. You see a lot of red there. Then you jump forward to during the shutdown this year and you see that stark contrast and the lack of nitrogen dioxide in the air. Now you have to be very careful when analyzing this kind of data from satellites because it's not just ground level nitrogen dioxide they're taking into account, but also upper level. The weather plays a big factor. Clouds play a big factor, but NASA has gone through a lot of it and now they're starting to give us some of that interesting information. All right, here's a nice shot of the sun that we had earlier today. This is in New Braunfels. Sun was up. You see that halo around the sun. That's a 22 degree halo. We often see that when we have the high thin clouds streaming overhead, such as today, those high cirrus clouds, because the light actually travels through the ice crystals in those clouds, bends twice and makes that little halo. Anyway, those clouds are pushing off to the southeast and we'll have some thicker low clouds when we wake up in the morning. We still have the upper level ridge that's nosing its way into town and it's going to be a primary driver of our weather in the days ahead. So hazy, hot and humid conditions and the jet stream bumping way up to our north. And so we're on the hot side of that jet stream on the warm side. And you're going to notice that the next several days where you get these dips in the flow, those kinks, that's where you have the cooler air and even more active weather. But you look at the temperatures out there and we're still in the 80s in parts of Texas, whereas on the cooler side of that boundary, well, some 50s out there. Right now, 82 Carrizo Springs Junction at 80, 76 here in San Antonio. The humidity was down again today. It was not all that muggy, but the humidity is starting to creep its way back into town. You first start with the coastline. Corpus Christi, Dew Point is 65, Beeville 68 even in the low 60s in Gonzales. Well, as we go through time here, look at this first thing tomorrow morning and boom, dew points across the board well into the 60s. So noticing and feeling that humidity back into the air. Some people love it. And you know what? You'll love this weekend then. It's going to be muggy and pretty much just as hot as today. And that humidity sticks around until another cool front hits by the middle part of next week. So here's your weekend outlook 67 tomorrow morning with the low clouds that'll burn off by midday, a lot of afternoon sun in the lower 90s, and we pretty much just repeat it into Sunday. And then early next week, we'll see the temperatures rise a little bit. Mid 90s Monday and Tuesday, we could even see some upper 90s around Bear County on Tuesday afternoon. Then that little cold front hits, and that'll take us from well into the 90s on Tuesday down into the lower 80s on Wednesday. So if you really liked yesterday and today, your time will come again. We just have to wait for next week, Wednesday, Thursday, and you'll notice some changes back in the air. Steve Isis. Thank you, Adam. All right, the NBA making some changes as we speak, and uh, it just means more postponements. Well, remember they told us earlier they would not make any decisions about the future of the league going forward on the coronavirus until the month of May, but right. it seems like the only decisions being made right now are more postponements when we come back more about what they're going to do with the lottery and the combine going forward and the coffee gang for the san antonio spurs back <laughs> and it's pretty hilarious coming up NBA Board of Governors has postponed indefinitely the draft lottery and the player combine originally scheduled for this month and now discussions have moved of starting the 2020-21 season in December and what could be the new norm for the league. When the NBA Commissioner Adam Silver suspended play in the NBA back on March 11th. He told us no decision on the future of the league would be made before May. Well, here it is. The first day of May has arrived and it does not appear that the league is any closer on if or when it will resume the NBA season this year. The NBA Board of Governors stopped short of postponing the NBA draft, which for now is scheduled to 
to take place on June the 25th. The NBA still sticking with May 8th as a date that teams can reopen their team facilities. That's one week from today in states that do not have more restrictive COVID-19 pandemic mandates. Spurs president and CEO R.C. Buford has told us that just because the NBA says it's okay to reopen practice facilities next Friday doesn't mean the Spurs are going to open their practice facility just yet. In a Zoom press conference with reporters on Thursday, Buford emphasized that player safety was paramount to the Spurs moving forward. Where we sit right now, this is uncharted territory, and I would guess that there are many of these guys that have never gone two months without being able to get into a gym. Everybody's dying to, to get into and dribble a ball, and, and so, um, but I do think that it won't be just, we can't just you know, blow a whistle and 10, 10 days later think that we're going to put our players in, a, in an environment that, that is safe to, to return from the time that they've had away. Now, Buford and his son Chase have been hands-on in the San Antonio Food Bank's attempt to try and help our community as much as possible with thousands in Bear County out of work during the COVID-19 pandemic. And during his press conference, took time out to praise others who have had a huge part in getting us through what he calls, as you just heard, these uncharted times. This situation transcends sports. And I don't think that there's anything uh, that any of us could have done to understand the impact of of uh, COVID, nor the um, the way it can bring communities together, and I think we've seen that through the leaders in our community and through the city and the county leadership in the way that people have stepped up to provide for for in areas of need. And Eric Cooper and the food bank and Haven for Hope, having been connected to those guys, I'm not sure. If anybody has outperformed them in our community or around the world, I don't know where it is. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Well, I mean, he's doing great and looking forward to playing football. New Texas wide receiver Brandon Cooks held his first press conference as being traded by the Rams for a second round draft pick in this year's draft. Texas general manager and head coach Bill O'Brien looking for help to fill the void left behind by the trade of DeAndre Hopkins to the Arizona Cardinals. But Cooks is coming off a season that saw his production dip from over 1,200 yards and five touchdowns in 2018 to just 583 yards on 42 catches and two touchdowns in 2019. So why does he think his production was down last season? I've dealt with some things, uh, you know, uh, on the field, and um, but it, it, that does not go to show what type of player I am, the production that I've been putting in year in and year out since I've been in the league. That was just one of those, uh, you know, off years. But, um, you know, it comes with the game. And, uh, but that definitely is not the, uh, you know, trend that, you know, you should be looking for me as a player. The latest meeting of the Spurs Coffee Gang. Next. <laughs> All eyes on NASCAR as they prepare to be the first major U.S. sport to restart the season during the COVID-19 pandemic, knowing that they'll be closely watched by other professional leagues looking to restart their own seasons. More than 700 people with no fans are expected to be at the track when racing returns to national television audience on May the 17th at Darlington. Now, Darlington Raceway will host the first of seven races over 11 days using both Darlington and Charlotte Motor Speedway. The reason why NASCAR wants to use those two venues is that they're located within driving distance of teams based in Charlotte to eliminate air travel and hotel use. Finally, the Spurs Coffee Gang continued today, not in person like in the past meetings, but online today featuring Patty Mills, Boris Dio, Manu Ginobili, and Tiago Splitter. Here's a quick look at what was brought up today. <laughs> hey, buddy, have you, have you ever dunked? I mean, you know when you have one of these and you might have a biscuit or something and you dunk <laughs> it in here? Yeah, but I wore, <laughs> I wore my... I would love to count it in a warm-up, so if it counts, then yes, but in a game, for whatever reason, from the warm-ups to the game, the rim goes about this much higher. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you dunked in the warm-ups? It, it's in warm-up though, so there's going to be a little asterisk next to it. <laughs> <laughs> and that's actually designed what Pop used to do with the team, take them out to dinner all the time, so they like to keep that up now with not just current Spurs, but Spurs from the past. It great. was it was yeah. great to see that. That's awesome. Yeah, thank That's you, Greg. Great. The coronavirus impacting many high school seniors, how one local school district is celebrating the class of 2020. And it was a decision. It was decision day for students going to college. The local celebration here at home and how it compares to others in the nation. Plus. 
COVID-19 may have wrecked national car sales, but locally, dealers have shifted gears to sell. Coming up, what car shoppers can expect. It was quite the scene for seniors at Warren High School. A group of parents helped organize this parade. Students stopped the procession just long enough to announce their school or military branch of choice. While there was a parade and a chance to see classmates again, the celebration was bittersweet. We don't get prom, uh, senior skip day, our graduation possibly. A lot of stuff that a lot of people look forward to for 12 years just got stripped away from us all of a sudden. I was so excited to see these seniors who have lost the end of their senior year come out to celebrate their next journey. And the tradition held to announce a high school senior's decision on what to do next is being observed here at home and beyond. Today is National Decision Day. But with questions about whether campuses will be open next school year, some students are weighing their options. ABC's Marcy Gonzalez reports. This is traditionally a milestone for many high school seniors across the country. Decision day, the early deadline to commit to the college they plan to attend in the fall. But with COVID-19 concerns forcing campuses to close and leaving lingering uncertainty about how or when they'll reopen, the decision this year is especially difficult for students, including twins Jessica and Nicole Alexander, who were both accepted to every Ivy League school. Cool. Do that. We would definitely like to start in the fall, but it's hard because you don't really know what you're walking into. But some students are considering taking a semester off or a gap year, weighing whether the big price tag for their dream school is worth it if classes end up only being offered online. The activities in like community at Wesleyan have been a really big part of my decision to go there, like theater. Um, and if those weren't able to be realized in like the fall, I think I'd defer my attendance to January. Some schools already announcing plans to try to open this fall. Purdue University, Brown, and North Carolina all working to bring students back on campus, minus the large lectures and sporting events. The University of Arizona planning to do the same. Part of their plan, offering antibody tests to everyone on campus, having only one student per dorm room, and enforcing other restrictions. They will be properly socially distanced, People are going to need to wear masks. School leaders, though, acknowledging things could change between now and the start of the fall semester. If we look at the data and it's not safe, we're not going to open. And with so much uncertainty, many schools are now loosening their admissions requirements and hundreds are extending their enrollment deadlines. Marcy Gonzalez, ABC News, Los Angeles. I want to tell my seniors, number one, we love them, we miss them a lot, and we know that no matter what, that COVID-19 may have shut down San Antonio, but it's not going to shut down their lives or their futures. Graduating seniors at MacArthur High School may not get to walk the stage this year due to the coronavirus outbreak, but they will have their caps and gowns. Northeast ISD celebrating the class of 2020 with a special cap and gown pickup today. From the safety of their vehicles, which they were encouraged to decorate, seniors were able to get their graduation gear and return anything that belonged to the school. MacArthur faculty and staff were also there to help out or help hand out the caps and gowns and celebrate the seniors. Until the crisis is over, every weeknight we are trying to separate the facts from fiction surrounding the coronavirus. Tonight, Dr. Lisa Ochoa with the San Antonio Vascular and Endovascular Clinic joins us. Dr. Ochoa, thank you for joining us once again. I, I want to talk about, you know, we're reopening Texas at this point. That means a lot of elective surgeries are being put back on the books. What's your main message for patients who are thinking about getting one of these elective surgeries or have already scheduled having their elective surgery? Oh, that's a great question. And so the first question I ask is how, how urgent or how immediate do these elective cases need to be? And they vary. You know, some cases can probably wait another month, but there's some that have already been put on the back burner for three to four weeks and probably should be done sooner rather than later. 
the other question I would have a patient ask is, could this uh, procedure or surgery be done in a more controlled area, such as an ambulatory surgical center or an outpatient cath lab? I feel like those areas that are smaller have more controlled environment and theoretically can decrease the risk of uh, being exposed to COVID-19. The other question I would ask as a patient is, uh, can I get tested for the COVID-19 before I have surgery? And the reason that's important is there's been some early studies, we don't know for sure, but it's possible that patients that may be asymptomatic, no symptoms, that undergo general anesthesia for surgery may have some uh, complications more so because they're positive. And in that regard, they would want to hopefully delay that surgery until perhaps they test negative. Yeah, I would also yeah. tell people that just, you know, like I have questions written down here from our viewers for you, it's okay for them to go in with their own questions for the doctor or the surgeon to ask them and the, some of the questions that we've just gone over. They need to be their own advocate. That's a great point, and that's what I tell my patients is a, any of us physicians should be able to answer every single one of your questions. You are your own best advocate, and no question um, is too simple. Uh, please come into the office and ask all these questions. I mean, the reality is we're all making the best decisions we can with information that we have. And the more information a patient has, I think the better decision you can make for yourself as well. I know when we talked a couple of weeks ago, three weeks ago, maybe now, uh, you were concerned that you weren't seeing a lot of patients that you normally see. Uh, the volume of patients maybe was down. Is that still a concern for you? It still is a concern, and my concern is my patients are, are uh, very vulnerable patients. They have diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, chronic kidney disease, and those chronic medical conditions can lead to many different complications, and so what I've been seeing is I'm not seeing the same volume, and the ones that I am, they seem to be presenting a little bit later in their disease process, and, and that has me concerned because when they present later in the disease process, then they often leads to worse complications, and so that example in my specialty is patients who come in with ulcers that are so large or infected that there's not much more that we can do and may end up with complication like an amputation when perhaps if they presented earlier that would not have been the case but you are seeing evidence that people are just waiting before they come see a doctor i have and the, when i speak to the patients i can tell you that they're just like we don't know what's going on, there's a lot of anxiety and fear that they have and they're being told to stay home and, and they're doing as they're told. But what I do want to encourage them is to reach out for help from their primary care doctors, from their specialists. There are a lot of doctors here that can see them in a safe manner. And they still need to take care of those chronic medical conditions so that they don't end up in the hospital uh, like we don't want them to. Do you have thoughts on whether it's too soon to reopen Texas? <laughs> That's a good question, and I think we all have been asking ourselves that. Um, I guess the real answer is I don't know. I do, I am happy that we're taking a very staged approach in San Antonio. I'm happy that we have our public health committee that the mayor put together where they're getting the health experts to make recommendations on how we open and what the markers are for, as a marker to, to open up. Um, as long as we are cautious and safe and make sure we continue to measure what we're doing and be willing to take that step backwards and hold back a bit if we see that we're headed in the wrong direction. I know that you're a vascular surgeon, so obviously you watch what's going on with arteries and blood clots and possible strokes. There are some that say that they have seen complications from COVID-19 patients that lead to blood clots and could potentially lead to strokes. Are you hearing the same thing from your colleagues? Yes, I am. I follow my colleagues on the East Coast, New York, New Jersey. They see a lot of these. And it's interesting because we're worried about, you know, the respiratory symptoms. But what we're finding is these COVID patients are, in medical terms, we call hypercoagulable. They're prone to blood clots. And they're seeing young patients uh, that would be odd to see a stroke in. They're seeing strokes in those patients. They're seeing blood clots in uh, the legs uh, called deep venous thrombosis that can lead to pulmonary embolism or clots that break off and go through their lungs. And so these are our life-threatening complications. My colleagues have been talking about trying to prevent those clots in COVID patients, whether we need to start them on blood thinners, on partial blood thinners. I think these are good conversations to have. We're gonna learn a lot uh, as we go on. And as long as uh, the medical community communicates with each other, then we can figure out how we can best take care of these patients when we see them here in San Antonio. I wanna give you the final word tonight. What do you want our viewers to take home from this conversation? I want them to know that we are medical professionals. We're all trying to make the best decisions 
for the healthcare of patients. And so ask questions of your doctors, ask questions of the hospitals and the clinics that you go to, be your own best advocate, and know that we are all trying to do our very best. And the more information that you have, then you can make a better decision about your health. Be your own and best advocate. Dr. Lisa Ochoa, thank you for your time. Thank you. We'll be right back. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. It has been a bumpy road for car sales. Nationally, car buyers hit the brakes, turning April into the worst month in 30 years. Toyota's U.S. sales down a whopping 55% compared to the year before. Mazda was down 44% and Hyundai down 38%. But locally, the picture is not nearly as dismal. In fact, one dealer tells our Marilyn Moritz people are still buying cars and it's just in a different way. Many San Antonio dealerships are seeing foot traffic despite a national Carmageddon of dismal sales. March was off. March was off. But Mark Cross says April was surprisingly not horrible at his Ford dealership. Used car sales were down 25%, but he says sales of new cars, pickups, and SUVs were actually better than a year ago. Well, I mean, first of all, we were deemed an essential business. And so I've got dealer friends of mine across the country that were literally shut down. His, like other showrooms, is open for business with face covers, distancing markers, and half shifts. Not exactly business as usual. They've shifted gears to online for most customers. It's still hard to buy a car and, and have enough guts to click the button like you're buying a sweater on, you know, Amazon or something. Test drives include plastic coverings and disinfectant, but are often skipped. Texas appears a different picture than much of the country. Nationally, COVID-19 wrecked car sales across all brands. Analysts say April sales were down more than 52% from last year. As for the road ahead. I think this summer is going to be like there's going to be a lot of businesses, there's a lot of pent up demand. And for consumers, incentives like 0% financing and lots full of inventory, dealers need to move. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. USAA is returning an additional $280 million in dividends to auto insurance policyholders based on fewer drivers on the road. It's similar to last month where more than $500 million in dividends was given to members as a 20% credit for two months worth of premiums. This new additional credit will reflect 20% of the third month's worth of premiums. All auto policyholders in effect as of April 30th will receive the credit. Let's take a live look outside with live cam, 78 degrees out there, and uh, we're getting ready for the weekend, Adam. Yes, and it's upon us now, and a little change in our weather pattern is basically underway as we speak, and the humidity, it's going to be back in full effect the next several days until our next cool front hits next week. And yeah, we will have another one that'll impact our temperatures, but only bring us a slight chance of rain. So we'll jump into that in a moment. First, another uh, new image from NASA, their scientific visualization studio. They've been sifting through the data because this nitrogen dioxide pollution, the concentration of it in the atmosphere is very tricky to to really pin down in terms of a good average because the conditions, the weather conditions, cloud cover, day to day it can change drastically even when we're not in a shutdown. But this is what they've come up with after carefully looking at the data. The average nitrogen dioxide pollution level for March 15th to April 15th from 2015 to 2019 seen here, right on the left hand side of your screen. Then you compare it to during the shutdown in Florida and that's a big difference. And this is the trend we've seen that we've compared Florida, southeastern United States, northeastern United States, parts of California. I'm still waiting on the Texas data to come out. Promise me. I'm, I mean, I promise you I'm keeping a close eye on and I'll let you know right away once I see it and see if there's any kind of impact here. Long term impacts. We have no idea. Still too early to tell. A lot of research will be done, though. This has been quite a uh, unique situation for researchers especially climate researchers, and really an opportunity for them because they don't get this kind of break in pollutants ever. 
right? And so they can test their models too. A lot, a lot to talk about. So 92, that was our high temperature today. The average being 84, uh, the record 99. This time of year, you have to get well into the 90s, even near 100 to be in record breaking territory. And we'll be in the 90s, but we won't be breaking any records anytime soon. Rio Medina 73, Canyon Lake Bulverde 74, Floresville you're 75. Not bad out there this evening. There's starting to be a hint of humidity in the air, but it's not overwhelming, at least not yet. Closer to the Rio Grande, we're in the 80s. Now look what happens to our temperatures. Into the weekend, still low 90s. Next week, mid 90s, maybe some upper 90s on Tuesday. But Tuesday night, that's when the cold front hits. And that drops us a good 15 degrees as we get into Wednesday of next week. So if you liked yesterday and today, we'll get similar conditions. You just have to wait till the middle to end of next week. So dew points in the 50s, but east of I-35 starting to get into the 60s. The southeasterly wind is boosting those dew points. Hold on, come on model data. Sometimes our model data does this. I'm giving you five more seconds here model. Why does it do this sometimes? Sometimes it updates and we get new information and then it takes a second to actually populate on the graphic. And of course, that happens to be right now when we're on air. Well, here's what this would show. Two points in the 60s all the way through Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, they drop off and there's a little lack of humidity there because of that cold front next week. 67 in the morning tomorrow, 91 by the afternoon. Despite some morning clouds, we'll have a lot of sunshine by midday and afternoon. Basically a repeat as we get into Sunday and then next week. I already talked about that temperature jump. Rain chances, they're there, they're just pretty slim. 20% chance Tuesday and Wednesday around that front. And we could see a few pop-up storms toward the end of the week. Steve, ECs? Ah, uh, you gotta love technology, oh. huh? Yes, thank you, Adam. Night Beat in Review is coming up next. San Antonio moving into a new phase as we wrap up six weeks since our first confirmed case of COVID-19. The new normal still includes masks, but there are more businesses allowed to reopen. Here's this week's Snipe Beat in Review. New stay home work safe orders announced and while more businesses are open, the city and county are still urging residents to stay at home as much as possible. Masks are required and while there is no fine for those who don't follow the rule, businesses could push for a criminal trespass charge if you're not wearing one on the property. So it may not have the fine, uh, but there's other measures in to make sure that people are doing that. And while restaurants can allow for dine in options, bars will not be reopened. So how will officials be able to tell the difference between a restaurant and bar? Under the governor's order, it, it makes it pretty clear that if your uh, sales of alcohol exceed your sales of food, then you're probably you're in the bar category. So the governor has already given the okay for churches to gather with restrictions in place that comply with social distancing practices and look out for the most vulnerable. City health experts say based on local data, they recommend that churches wait a bit longer to hold services. The six indicators are split into two categories, one gauging progress and the other warnings. Metro Health wants to see a sustained decrease in the number of positive tests within a 14 day period. Metro Health plans to begin posting these indicators so you can track them online starting Monday. A night beat update on the lockout at an apartment complex. Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf saying the almost club apartment complex may have sidestepped the issue of evictions. From what I've gathered from the staff is that they didn't evict anybody. Uh, they put a lock on their door and said if they want in, they have to come to the office. It may technically not be an eviction, but it certainly was an intimidation. County Commissioner Justin Rodriguez said that the county's ban on evictions is set to expire on Thursday. It will likely be extended through the month of May. These Patel systems can decontaminate up to 80,000 masks a day. To have the confidence to send your folks out into homes and dealing with people that are, are potentially sick, you need to make sure that you have PPE. 
Chief Hood says four decontamination units will be up and running by this weekend. Drive through experience at the San Antonio Zoo. It's sold out in under two hours. Because of the increase in demand, the zoo has added more dates and tickets are now on sale for $60 per car. It's all in an effort to keep the facility running amid the pandemic. Once we closed, we lost all of our ability to generate um, a regular income. And, and the, the simple math is it cost about $500,000 a week to operate the zoo and care for the animals. And so um, we've been able to reduce that a little bit with savings on expenses, things like that, but still around $300,000. The drive through experience is a first for the zoo. To buy your tickets, just head on over to sazoo.org. But because of an unexpected technical difficulty, the virtual parade will now air on their Facebook page on Sunday at 3 p.m. And no matter the hour, we are always online at ksat.com, our web team, keeping track of the coronavirus pandemic with the latest numbers and the many efforts underway to help our community through this trying time. We have an entire page dedicated to this effort. It's all online at ksat.com. Well, the Denver Zoo has something to celebrate. Two African lion cubs were born to mom Kamara and dad Tobias. The cubs will eventually join three other lions in the pride. Mom and babies will stay behind the scenes for about two months for bonding time. The, Den the Denver Zoo is posting updates on social media. If I could do the Lion King like opening, go, uh, I would, but I can't. I can't. Do it. Yeah, there you go. There you go. It's a different kind of animal parade in Oakland County, Michigan. Meanwhile, the Ferndale Elks Club there going viral for a pop-up parade. Members dressing up as inflatable T-Rex, oh, a unicorn, awesome. a shark, even the Stay Puffed Marshmallow Man. They just this walk. Is is her, they just alligator. walk up and down Ferndale streets at random. Just to make people smile and <laughs> I love maybe it. maybe scratch their head a little bit. I, their spacing oh is goodness, impeccable that is too. Such a great idea. They're in masks. They're yeah, exactly. They're, They've got watch, face coverings. I could watch that video all evening. I'm I telling you, it. there's obviously this COVID's been bad, but a lot of interesting things yeah. have come out of it. <laughs> it's you know? pretty funny. Have a good weekend. Good night. Good night.